All right, well, good morning. It is great to be with you guys again this morning. And I, uh, I don't know about you, but after last week, I really, honestly, guys, I needed to come into the presence of some of the people of God. And I needed to sing about the goodness of God, about the faithfulness of God, about the promises of God. And I pray that that was good for your soul as it was for my own. I love what Matt had to say. We're going to continue this conversation on this topic of revival that we've been going at now for four weeks, including today. And as he said, we've come today to the topic of, all right, well, what keeps revival away? And that's a really significant question. Now, we've talked about what revival is, a special season of divine visitation in which God the Holy Spirit comes and he awakens his slumbering church. We've talked about what its goal is. We've said, look, the goal of revival is God's presence revealed to the world how? Through you, through me, through us, through the church, through his people. And last week, I thought Matt did a brilliant job talking about what revival looks like. What does it look like in a person? What does it look like in a people? And one of the things that he said that stuck with me, like I wrote it down as soon as he said it, I thought it was really good, is he said, man, guys, don't wait for revival to come to you. You go after it. And that plays into this question. What keeps revival away? Because look, what we've learned is that we can't bring revival. Only God can do that. But here's what we can do. We can examine ourselves personally. We can examine ourselves as a church. We can examine ourselves corporately as the church in our city, our county, our part of the world, and all over the place for the kinds of things that God in his word comes to us and says, all right, so if you want to know, here's what I will not bless with my reviving presence. And that brings us today. Isaiah 58, beginning in verse 1. And I love what God does here because he comes to Isaiah and it's like he's going, all right, so here's the deal. I have a message and I want you to deliver it. But before I tell you what it is, I'm going to tell you how to do it. It's that tone that Matt just talked about. He comes to Isaiah and he says, cry aloud. He's like, look, whatever you do, Isaiah, in delivering this message, don't be quiet about it. He says, do not hold back. He's like, listen, you're going to be tempted to hold back. There are going to be things that you're not going to want to say. This is not going to be popular. You're not going to want to do this. Don't hold back. Lift up your voice, he says, like a trumpet, which everyone in Israel would have realized is a reference to the shofar, that that ram's horn that was blown in the nation of Israel to call the whole nation to attention. He's like, this is a public announcement. It's not a private conversation you have with somebody at lunch. No, no, no. Here's the thing. Cry aloud, do not hold back, lift up your voice like a trumpet, and then in that fashion I want you to declare to my people the sins of all these other people around them because they're amazingly horrifying. Look at what these guys are doing, and look at what these guys are saying, and look what these guys are posting, and look at, did you read this? Did you see that? Did you do? It's not it. He says, no, no, no. I'll take care of everyone else. Vengeance is mine, God says. I will repay. You don't have to. So let's try this again. Cry aloud. Do not hold back. Lift up your voice like a trumpet and declare to my people their transgression. To the house of Jacob, to the church of God, their sins, which God will say in a moment is going to be completely disorienting to them. Like, they're, they're not going to believe it. Like, they're not going to be able to hear it. Like, they're going to be mystified by it. They're, they're going to be like, what, what, what are you talking about? And, and the reason that it's going to catch them off guard is because these guys are ruthlessly religious. Like, they are all about religious activity. God lays it out. He says, yet they seek me daily. Listen to that. And they delight to know my way. See, in our language, what does that mean? It means they do their personal worship every day. It means they catch Sam's podcast when it comes out on Thursday. It means they come to church every Sunday, or at least they tune in. It means they're involved in a community group, maybe even virtually, even in quarantine. It means they volunteer in the children's ministry or the student ministry, or maybe they play in the worship band, or maybe they're one of the pastors, or maybe they volunteer in the community. Like, they are all about it. And yet God is going to come to these people, and what he's revealing is the inauthenticity of this. He's saying, guys, all of that stuff that you're doing is not authentic. It's not real. It's not God-centered. It's self-centered. He says, they seek me daily. They delight to know my ways as if, there it is, they were a nation that did righteousness, which is what I want. But they're not that nation. And as if they were a nation, they were a people that did not forsake the judgment of their God, but they clearly do. And here's the end result. God says, so here's the experience they're having with me right now. They ask of me righteous judgments, 
Meaning they gather up all of their religious activities and all of their religious accomplishments and they come to me like, like as if it was some kind of a payment and then they, they give it to me and they say, all right, now God, this is what we've done for you. Here's what we want you now to do for us in return for all of this. We want you to bring righteous judgment on these people and on these people and on these people and on these people and on these people. And God's like, hey, listen, if it's righteous judgment you want, the people who are going to get it are you. He says, they ask of me righteous judgments. They delight, you can hear the sarcasm, to draw near to God, but only for their own purposes. And since I, God, will not honor that kind of faith, I will not answer that kind of prayer. Well, then here's their complaint against me, God. They say, why have we fasted and you see it not? You take no notice. You're not, you're not doing anything. Why have we humbled ourselves and you take no knowledge of it at all? It's like it's, it's as if we're not doing it. I mean, God, we're doing our part. We're looking for you to do your part. We've made the payment. Where's the payoff? And God answers by saying, behold, in the day of your fast, in the day in which you deprive yourself, you're not seeking me. You seek your own pleasure. And here's the evidence, he says, whereas, yes, you do fast. I'll give you that. What else do you do? You oppress all your workers. You engage in acts of oppression against people who are weaker than you. Behold, he says, you fast only to then turn around and what? Quarrel and to fight and to hit people less powerful than you with a wicked fist, whereas I, your God, make it everywhere clear in my word that I am a God who dwells with the crushed and with the lowly. It's like your heart's not like mine. All these religious activities aren't making you like me. He says, is such the, the fast that I choose, what, what, what you're doing here, a day for a person to humble himself? Is it to bow down his head like a reed and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Will you, he says, call this, what you're doing, a fast and a day acceptable to the Lord because what God's saying is it absolutely, manifestly, undeniably is not. And you say, all right, well then what is exactly? Like what kind of religious activities, if you will, manifest the kind of faith that God then does honor with his presence? He answers. He says, it's not this the fast that I choose. To loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the straps of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke. Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house? And when you see the naked, to cover him, and please don't miss this, he says, and not to hide yourself from your own Flesh, what in the world does that mean? Well, we find the answer to that on the first page of the Bible. How was humanity created? Because we as Christians have a unique understanding of this. Like God, who is the creator himself, comes to us and he says that the first man from whom all of humanity came was formed from the dust, from the soils of the earth. Time out. What are the colors of the soils of the earth? They're black, they're brown, they're kind of tan or beige, they're white. They're sort of yellow, they're kind of reddish, you know. You get up into Georgia, you got the red clay. That sound familiar? It's the various colors of our skin. What do we learn on page one of the Bible that Isaiah is referring to here? He's saying, listen, guys, when you become prideful about the color of your skin, when you become judgmental of other people based upon the color of your skin, it is a biblical absurdity. And why is that? Because effectively what you're saying is my pile of dirt is somehow more valuable than yours. That's not what makes us valuable. And don't miss this. We are all valuable. What makes us valuable is that all of us bear the image of the living God. He breathes into us and we have the breath of life. We reflect him, no one more than the other. No matter your dirt, no matter its color. He's coming and saying, my goodness, when you oppress those people, you are oppressing yourself like you're, 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 you're hiding from your own flesh. So then what does it look, to do, look like to do righteousness and justice? What reflects the heart of God? He told us. 
Loose the bonds of the wickedness. Undo the straps of the yoke. Let the oppressed go free. Break every yoke. Share your bread with the hungry. Bring the homeless poor into your house. When you see the naked, to cover him and not to hide yourself from your own flesh. Then, he says, when all of your religious activity begins to produce a heart like that, then shall your light break forth like the dawn and your healing shall spring up speedily. Your righteousness shall go before you and the glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call and the Lord will answer you. You shall cry and what will he say? Because it's the goal of revival. He will say, here I am. Right here with you. Oh, if you take away the yoke from your midst. But what else? And the pointing of the finger. What is that? We point our finger at others accusingly. We differentiate ourselves from others. The pointing of the finger and speaking wickedness about them, words of scorn, words of slander, words of contempt. Why, or contempt. Why is that important? Because as Dr. John Oswald says, oppression of the poor and the weak will not stop ultimately until they are no longer seen as objects of scorn and contempt or as pitiable victims. They must be seen as persons of worth and dignity brothers and sisters under God. God continues in verse 10. He says, look, if you pour yourself out for the hungry and you satisfy the desire of the afflicted, then shall your light rise in the darkness and your gloom be as the noonday. And the Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your desire in scorched places and make your bones strong, the idea being with his very presence, and I love this image that he says, and you, my people, shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water, whose waters do not fail. What is God saying? He's saying, listen, guys, you can't bring revival. Only I can bring revival. But here's what you can do. You can examine yourselves personally, corporately, as a church, as the church. You can examine yourselves for the very things that I will not bless with my reviving presence. He's saying, look, the kind of faith that I bless with my presence is not self-centered. It is God-centered. And it's full of religious activity that is motivated by a desire and a passion to be with me, to find me, and more than that, to become like me in ever-increasing fashion, dying more and more unto sin and living more and more unto righteousness. That's the idea. And he's saying, look, when that happens, when you're like me in here, then here's what's going to start happening out here. You're not only going to stop oppressing other people, you're going to start advocating for oppressed people. You're not only going to stop drawing distinctions between yourself and other people, you're going to begin to see them as your own family, as your own flesh. As you see yourself. You're not only going to stop speaking words that reveal a heart of scorn or contempt toward other people, but you're going to start seeing people as, as, as persons of worth and of dignity, brothers and sisters under God. And then finally, you're going to stop pouring yourself out just for you. And you're going to start to pour yourself out for them. And since this quarantine began as a church, we have been pouring ourselves out, and we've been pouring ourselves out toward the hungry and toward the homeless, toward the unborn and toward struggling small businesses that we've been trying to help keep alive. We've been pouring it out to one another. We've said, as Ryan said earlier, hey, if you need help, help at reavistachurch.com. Let us know. We want to dialogue with you with that. We want to see how we can help you with that. But here's what we haven't addressed, and it has raised itself twice in our country as we've watched the passions be inflamed. We have not addressed the undeniable reality that our black brothers and sisters experience life in our country and in our city very, very differently than we do. And when I say than we do, I'm talking about people who are made of dirt that's white. And that is absolutely not the case for everybody at Rio. I am rejoicing that not everyone at Rio looks like me. But I will say that, okay, probably most people at Rio look like me. And so primarily today, I'm, I'm going to talk to people who look like me. You know, I probably spent 25 hours this week talking on the phone nonstop, 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 and a lot of it with my black pastor friends. 
I sought out three of these guys that I'm in relationship with and I've been in relationship with for several years now and I just went to them and I, 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 I confessed to them and I heard from them and I listened to them and I typed all of their thoughts down. It was like, man, please, please help me. And I went to them, not a reporter, not a talking head on TV, not somebody with an agenda, but to people who I trust, people who I love, people who I know, people who are my friends authentically. And I went to them for those reasons, and I went to them because I'm white. I mean, like, I am super white. I'm going to tell you who I am ethnically, okay? So to kind of give you some context and understanding, like total transparency, you'll realize and recognize in what I'm about to say my own personal limitations, and frankly, I want you to know that. So I was born into an entirely Dutch family, and when I mean entirely, I mean 100% entirely Dutch. My grandparents on my mother's side emigrated from the Netherlands. They came here not speaking English, but just Dutch. My great-great-grandparents on my dad's side emigrated from the Netherlands. And what happened in the way that it all worked back then is you would show up and you were sponsored by other Dutch people and they secured a job for you and they secured a place for you. They were your ticket into the country and you lived in community with the other Dutch-speaking reformed religious people. And so what happened for reasons of religion, for reasons of culture, for reasons of language, for practical reasons, meaning, you know, everybody was just sort of relying on everybody to make it through, is everybody married inside of the Dutch community. It's remarkable. Not until literally my generation, I mean, very rarely prior to my generation, did any one of the Dutch people in America marry outside of the Dutch community. Like my dad jokes today, because all three of us, my, my brothers and me, married non-Dutch women. And, and so my dad's like, man, we have so better at the gene pool. Like the kids are better looking, they're more intelligent. You know, like it's, it's a funny sort of a joke that, I mean, generationally really wasn't all that funny. Add to that wealth. So my dad became a successful business person. We moved to Miami. We moved into a neighborhood that is not racially exclusive, but it's economically exclusive. I don't ever remember seeing a black person in my neighborhood living there. Not one. I went to a very expensive private Christian school. Again, not racially exclusive, but economically. There were three black kids in my high school. The whole high school. limitations in that. There's privilege in that. There just is. And I have to tell you, I'm grateful for the Dutch people. You know, just like every other people group on the planet, there are just some cool things about that group of people. I'm incredibly thankful for the family that raised me. I'm incredibly thankful for a privilege that I did not appreciate, I did not understand. I kind of figured, I don't know, pretty much everyone I knew was like this. Man. Very few people like this. I'm thankful for that, but I will tell you, it divorced me entirely from what my black pastor friends, whom I have sought out in relationship and who have, I am so grateful, poured into me to help increase my understanding. It completely divorced me from what one of my black friends calls the black experience in America. No categories, no understanding. So I called these guys this past week, and I talked to people like Isaac Petit Ferrer. Isaac is a Haitian American. He's a pastor here in this community. His dad is also a pastor here in this community. And Isaac's story is really interesting. He said, you know, Tom, he said, I, I've kind of experienced the white experience, and I've also experienced the black experience. And here's what I mean by that. He said, even though I grew up in the hood, his language, not mine, he said, my parents never let me out the front door. Like, that did not become where I found my community, but instead they sacrificed to send me to Westminster Academy, which is where my kids went after they left Bethany Christian School. It's where a lot of you went to school. A lot of your kids go there. Great place. Wonderful school. Very expensive. He said, but the truth of the matter is, like, except for being one of the only black kids at the white school, he said, I really didn't experience a lot of repercussions. I mean, you know, we got pulled over from time to time, but I just figured that was normal. He said it was in my senior year of high school. He said it was kind of a little bit later, maybe 9.30 at night or something. It was shortly before Publix closed. And his mom wanted him to pick up some stuff, so he stops at Publix to get some cereal and a couple of other things. He goes inside the Publix, he gets the items, he brings them to the counter. 
pays for them. They're in a bag. There's a receipt in the bag. He comes walking out of Publix. And the, what he notices as he walks out of the door is there are like seven police cars. And while he's trying to figure out what the heck is going on, he's tackled by a German shepherd. A police officer jumps on his back, another puts his foot on his head. He's freaking out because he doesn't know what the heck is happening. They handcuff him. They put him in a car. They ask him some questions. He's there for about an hour, and then they release him and say, you're free to go home. And his dad went back later and was like, what was that all about, you know? And apparently someone in the store, almost certainly someone white who looks like me, said that there was a black man, a young black man in Publix who was stealing things. He graduated from Westminster Academy actually with our own Ryan Brasington and his wife Julie, our worship pastor here, Brad Schmidt who's the pastor of City Church Fort Lauderdale, Roby Barnes who's the pastor of City Rev out west, wonderful amazing group of guys. And he went down to the University of Miami after that, he got his undergraduate degree from UM, he got a PhD in economics from UM. And he said when he was at the University of Miami, he experienced that same kind of thing on at least four other occasions. He said the night before he defended his doctoral dissertation, he was starving and he's up all night you know, to get ready because you meet with this committee and they've all read your dissertation and now they're going to ask you questions and you have to defend it successfully to get your PhD like this is the culmination of all of your doctoral work. And he's hungry and it's like 2 a.m. And so he goes to Denny's and I'm not going to lie, I grew up in Miami, I know exactly where the Denny's is. The Gables were my backyard. Went there all the time. I have eaten at that Denny's, I'm sorry, at 2 a.m. like 25 times, okay? So he was there. He eats, he leaves. He says, Tom, the night that I'm, the before I, I defend my doctoral dissertation, I'm on my face on Ponce de Leon Boulevard in handcuffs, and I'm just praying, oh, God, please don't let me be detained because I, I have to, Defend my dissertation in the morning. I think of our own Winston Miller. I spoke with him. Winston is our church planning resident here at the church. And we've had just the privilege, man, of getting to know he and Brenda and their precious family. They're just amazing, incredible people, beloved here at Rio. Uh, pretty much just beloved, I think. I think to know Winston is to, is to love him, and the same is true for Brenda, but he has the same kinds of stories. He was sharing with our staff how he took his son, Alex, Alex is 16, to the hardware store the other day. They're doing some work in a home in Lauder Hill where we're going to plant a church with him in the months to come, this year sometime. And so anyway, he, he just went and he found what he was looking for. And it was just a couple of things, like you could just carry them in your hand. You know, I don't know, a couple of screws or something, you know. And so he put them on the counter and, and he paid for them. And, you know, Alex and the store guy was thinking he's just going to grab them and, you know, walk out the door because he just paid. He's got the stuff. And he said, excuse me, sir. He said, could you please put these items in a bag and then put the receipt in the bag? Would you do that for me, please, sir? And the guy's like, really? And Alex is thinking, Dad, just grab it, you know, let's go. I mean, what's the deal? And he's like, sir, really, please, I, I would appreciate it if you would put these items in a bag and then put the receipt in the bag, and then I'll, I'll take the bag. And so the man did, and Winston took the bag, and he took his son, and he went outside, and he said, do you know why I did that? Because I want you to do that every time you buy something at a store. Because somebody, most likely who looks like me, at some point is going to question, did you take that or did you pay for that? I'll tell you the story of a precious girl that I love. I've probably known her right about since the time that she was adopted. Her birthday is actually the day before me. So her birthday is August 28 and my birthday is August 29 and you guys already know that because you have that like on your calendar and on your refrigerator and you've been saving and, all, and the party's coming and all of that. So so we've actually celebrated our birthdays together because our families are close. Uh, this girl has been in school with my son since like pre-K two, and she is an African American. So anyway, she was a student here at Bethany Christian School, and when she was in middle school, so she's probably 13 years old, maybe eighth grade. Uh, her mom was running a little bit late, so her friend said, hey, you know, why don't you just come over to my house, lives back here in the Rio Vista neighborhood and just wait for your mom there. So text mom, mom's like, yep, sounds good. So she starts to make her way through the neighborhood that our church is located in. 
She's dressed in her Bethany Christian school uniform. So she has a khaki skirt on, if you know what that is. And she's got like a long sleeve, sort of a polo buttoned down with the Bethany logo here and the Bethany logo on the skirt. She's got her cute little socks, I'm sure, and, you know, shoes. And then she's got her school bag full of books. And she starts making her way through the neighborhood to get to her friend's house. And as she's going, she's realizing that there's a lady, looks like me, in an SUV driving next to her at the same speed. And I just want to pause for a second and say, you know, one of the reasons why I chose to tell this story is because I know that lady and I really actually love that lady. I do. And I chose to tell this story because like to some degree at least, I am that lady. Now, I've never tailed anybody. I've never called the police on anyone. But there's something about her that's in me too. And so that's where I jump out of the plane today, <laughs> wondering if I have a parachute on. Now I was talking to Beth, I said, I'm going to jump out of the plane like I'm just going to own some stuff, I'm just going to talk super plain like I'm just going to go for it. Don't hold back. What is your voice like a trumpet? And I said, I don't know how it's going to go. You know, I, I sit there eating lunch and I'm eating my little sandwich and all, I'm, all I can read about is how nobody can say anything right. And if there's anything that I hate about our society, and I don't use that word flippantly and I, frankly I don't use it often, it is the fact that we don't allow ourselves or anyone else to be imperfect. And we're not real clear on what perfect is either, incidentally. And what that does is it prevents us from speaking. It makes it terrifying to talk. Because as soon as you say this, people go, oh, he's that. And then if you don't say this, well, then they go, whoa, maybe he's that. Or you say this and they go, oh, man, he's the rich, white, privileged guy. You know, well, I confessed that already, didn't I? Oh, he doesn't get it. And you know, and, and you know what? You're right. I am limited in my wisdom, I am limited in my perspective, I am limited in my understanding. I, I am limited and in, in, in I'm like, I, I get it, like there's a lot of deficiencies here. But what I want you to see is my heart and my heart wants to know, it wants to get it, it wants to make it right, it wants to do what Isaiah is telling us to do as the voice of God. And what I need to do and what you need to do is to realize that we're one flesh. It's to stop doing this. It's to stop speaking the words of scorn. It's to, to receive one another as brothers and sisters under God with dignity and worth. It is to wake up to the biblical reality that the color of our skin means zero. It doesn't matter that we bear the image of the living God. And it is to behave as a human family that owns one another's issues and problems and even helps one another in our sins. What does a family do? I mean, they're stuck with each other, guys. So what do they do? Well, sometimes they hurt each other and sometimes they encourage each other and sometimes they wound each other and sometimes they lift each other up. But in the process of all of that, if they're really in it together and if they're humble and willing to learn from each other, they perfect each other. If everyone is scared to say anything, and I am nervous, then no one is going to say anything. And we're not going to get anywhere. So look, here's the deal. I, I've never slowed down. You know, I, I've never tracked anybody. But I've lived in my neighborhood for 20 years. We bought our house for $270,000 20 years ago this week. And I thought I was cutting my arm and leg off. It's now worth three times that thereabouts. So it turned out to be a good decision. I could never move into this neighborhood today. We have walked through our neighborhood. Beth walks through it every day. She knows everyone in it. She knows everybody's pets. I knew most of the people. I know most of their pets. We've seen people walk, move in, move out. Houses like ours torn down, big beautiful ones built in their place. I've never seen a black person move into our family or into our neighborhood rather. 20 years. And I will confess sometimes if I see somebody, I think, huh, I don't slow down. I don't call the police. 
but that's something I've got to deal with. And I share it with you because I'm speaking mostly to people who look like me, and I'm not alone. So this poor kid who's now terrified because she's got SUV lady following her at a snail's pace is thinking, what in the heck is going on? So she turns the corner to see if the lady's going to follow her. Sure enough, the lady follows her. So now she's really freaking out. So she goes and hides behind somebody's car, which from the SUV lady's perspective looks really suspicious now, doesn't it? I mean, what is she hiding? What's going on? Well, she's scared to death. Her mom comes to the scene, she gets in the car, and up pulls the police officer. It's actually the other reason I chose this story, because I'm personal friends with the police officer. That police officer is an amazing guy. I love that guy. Before he retired and moved out of town with his precious wife, they were a part of our church, a part of our family. He is a servant of servants. He is a servant of the community. And by servant of the community, I mean every person in the community, no matter what color your dirt is. That's him. And that's every police officer I know. And I know what my black brothers and sisters want to say, and I promise I will say it for you in about a minute. But I called another police officer yesterday and talked with him on the phone for about an hour. I said, listen, here's what I'm going to talk about. Here's what I'm going to say. Speak. And man, did he speak. He, too, is just a solid guy. He's wounded by the thought that he's a racist. And these guys need our prayers like everyone else in this community. They are tired. They're not getting any time off. They are stressed. They're worried about their families. And they're under a tremendous amount of pressure. Think about what we ask of our police. We ask them to be social workers and marriage counselors and conflict resolution experts and addiction experts. Oh, and law enforcement people who put their lives at risk all of the time every single day. And their families endure the stress of that as well to bring order and peace to our community. And right now they are doing it under the most severe of scrutiny where you feel like, man, if I say the wrong thing, if I even move the wrong way, if I do the wrong thing, I could lose my job, I could lose my career, I could put my family in jeopardy, I could, I could, I could, I could, I could. It's very, very difficult. It's very difficult. But here's what my black friends want to say, and so I'm going to say it. They're going to say, Tom, you are the poster child of white people. You just said it. Like, you know, look up white guy in the dictionary. It's you. And so, yeah, I mean, your experience with law enforcement is dramatically different from our experience with law enforcement. And you know what? They're right. And that's the point that I'm trying to make in relating these stories. And it's not just law enforcement. It's a white person at Publix who calls the police. It's a white person who tails this precious kid through the neighborhood and scares her half to death. But the experience is different. And there's no question about that. And you say, all right, so Tom, I've got a question for you. I, white guy, have a question for you. Uh, and it really, um, probably it's related to how uncomfortable you're willing to feel. Like, I mean, how uncomfortable you want to get? Like, how real now do you want to make this conversation? And I've already told you I'm out of the plane, and I don't know if I have a parachute on or not. I really won't know till probably about Wednesday because I think by then I will have received most of my emails and, and most of the text messages related to whatever I'm going to say, so I'll know if I splat on the ground by then or if actually I floated down somehow or something in between. But what do you want to say? So I think that a lot of white people would like to say, all right, maybe the reason why white people are more suspicious at times of black people and maybe the reason why the police bring a greater level of force if that's even the case and I don't know that to whatever the equation is if it involves a, a black person is because the crime rate Tom is disproportionately higher in the black community than it is in the white community and my response to that is honestly I'm offended and the reason for that, I would think, would be obvious. 
I don't think we can just look at all of these statistics and go, oh, well, that's, that's a problem that the black community has to address. I mean, clearly, you've got some you know, people in your community who are committing a lot of crime. They're giving everybody else a bad name. And if you guys will just deal with that, well, then it will flow out and everybody else will get a better reputation. And eventually, this will all fix itself as if we're not all in this together, which we're not, by the way, but need to be, and as if we have nothing to do with that. See, again, what my black friends would say, what, what Isaac called the black experience, he's like, man, the black experience started three or 400 years ago on the soil on which we live. And for three or 400 years, black people on this soil and throughout the life of our nation have been oppressed. They have been discriminated against. They have been enslaved. They have been put down. And they've been held down throughout the lion's share of the life of our nation, by law. It wasn't long ago that we said to black people, look, you can live in our city, but you've got to live here. We've got a big red line. We've circled it around this neighborhood. That's your place. Hey, you can get married, but you can't marry a white person. Hey, you can... Look, some of the laws have changed, and I celebrate that. Now, you talk to our black brothers and sisters, and they've got some ideas on some other ones that need to change. And maybe they're right about that, and we need to listen. We need to dialogue. Not as those who are going to be crucified on social media, but as those who say, no, no, no. We're one family, and this problem is ours. What we cannot do as white people is go, no, no, that's a black problem. You guys figure that out. I mean, if you need anything, let me know. But mostly, I'm just happy that it's all contained in your neighborhood, and it's out of mine. Look, if the things that happened in that neighborhood happened in your neighborhood, in my neighborhood, they would call out the Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marines to fix it. And you and I would be satisfied with nothing less. These people are our brothers and sisters. We as Christians uniquely understand that we are a family. And we may offend each other, and we might have to learn from each other, but we fight for each other. And their problem is our problem. You know, we don't draw a red line around the neighborhood anymore, but do you want to know where the neighborhood is? Here's the zip code, 33311. That's it for this city. It's not far from here, really. Look at the statistics of it. Roughly 70% of the homeless families come from one zip code in Broward County, that's it. Roughly 70% of the foster kids come from that same zip code. The family is wrecked in that zip code, and the family is the building block of society. Poverty, disease, mental health issues. We did a listening tour in the 33311 about a year ago, and we just went to all these different organizations that work in that neighborhood. Every single one of them mentioned mental health. My goodness, yes, there is more crime in that neighborhood. There is, and it drives up the rates. No question. But I think what we need to do is go, you know, that's, uh, that's not just their problem. That's my problem because those people are my family. And I'm not pointing fingers, and I'm not going to speak down, and I'm going to listen to what the Lord has to say to me about what I can do, how I can help. So anyway, my police officer friend comes on the scene, and he immediately realizes what's happened. He knows the mom. He knows the girl that was hiding behind the car. Probably he knows the lady in the SUV. He certainly had her on the phone. And I know this guy, and I know that he died about a thousand deaths in that moment. And he diffused the situation, and he said, guys, I'm so sorry, just, just go home, you know. And he told the lady what the deal is, and, and she was satisfied, and then, and then she was okay. And then as they're driving out of the neighborhood, there were four more police cars rushing into the neighborhood, and he diffused all of that. But I want you to think about what that does to somebody's heart. How does that affect someone's soul? Like, what message does that send? I mean, it sends the message of, hey, you know what? You don't fit here. You know what? You're not at home here. Hey, we as a society are more concerned about protecting people from you than we are about protecting you. You don't have a place here. So where does she go? Where does Isaac go? 
Where does Winston go? Bishop Clarence Glover is another guy that I talked to this week. He's a great man and a great friend. He's been to Rio, so hopefully you've heard him preach here. Uh, he's preached here a couple of times. And every time he preaches here, and it's so predictable, people come up to me afterwards and they're like, hey, Tom, and then they qualify it like this. You know, we love your preaching, but... And then they say something like, you know, when, are you, you know, when is the bishop going to come back? Like, you know, can he come back next week? Can he come back the week after that? Can he just preach here every week from now on? Because he's amazing. He's a great communicator. And he is a wise sage. Love that man. And one of the many things that he said to me this week is he said, Tom, only God can change this. It's good you're talking about revival. Only God can change this. But God can change this. However, it's going to take people of goodwill who are willing to have the faith and the courage, even though they might get killed, in the media at least, to say something. Twice he has said this to me. He has said, Tom, look, we talk about this all the time. Talk about it all the time in the black community. Talk about it all, my, all the time at Mount Bethel Baptist Church, which is in the 33311 zip code. It's where he pastors. He's been there for 36, I think, years. I don't know another pastor that's been around longer than him in this community. He said, look, we talk about this all the time. It is not until people like you, he said to me, speak up that anything is going to change. He said, really, it's not until white America says, you know what? This has to stop, that it's going to stop. Listen again to how God begins his message to Isaiah. He says, cry aloud, do not hold back. Lift up your voice like a trumpet and declare to my people their transgression, to the house of Jacob their sins. But why? To make everybody feel like a turd? Oh, be guilty. No, to heal us of our guilt and to bring justice and relief from oppression. By the way, do you know who the girl was? Her name is Rachel Lominick. She's Matt and Dee's youngest daughter. Let's pray together. Father, we come to you and honestly don't even know what to say. Holy Spirit, we ask that you would formulate our thoughts, that you would Speak to us in our hearts, God, that you would expose to us our sin, not to guilt us, but to deliver us and to to deliver those affected by our sin. Lord, impress upon us the reality that we're all just dirt apart from your image and that our dirt doesn't matter and isn't any more valuable than anybody else's. Make us your church an authentic family, red and yellow, black, white, whatever, all with faith in you. Ah, Lord, the goal of revival is the presence of God revealed to the world through your people. Well, the world can't solve this. Only God can solve this. God, solve this in your church and then solve it through your church. Lord, come. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.